Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. Well, I guess we know what today's episode is going to be about because there is only one story going on right now. This is Thursday, March 19th. And that is the story of the arising of the coronavirus and the planet's response to that. And wow, what a planet changer. When I think of where I was exactly one week ago, last Thursday, Chuck and I were getting on a plane, went to the airport, flew to Florida for a family reunion, had a great time with people who had been all over the place, went to restaurants and crowds, and got back just fine. I, I think it was when the next day when I went to the supermarket and saw some empty shelves. The place was by no means ravaged, but we don't have empty shelves in America. And that got me rattled. And then I, I contemplated the germosphere I w had just been in. So I am like most everybody, um, laying low here. Many of you are doing the same thing. I have listeners all over the world, and I know that many of you are in situations that are much worse. And God bless you. And from an integral perspective, I can mean that literally, if not mythically. So, and it's one of the things I love about integral is that it re-legitimizes the spiritual dimension of reality, including God in second person. Uh, not as something to believe in, but something to relate to, something to experience and inquire about, at least. And this all comes in handy during a plague as we get the existential nose rub into our, you know, radical vulnerability. I sometimes think we're ants on a sidewalk, you know, and our mortality, our, our, the apocalypse is assured for each and every one of us. And so I do want to offer some integral spiritual practice. I will, at the end of this podcast, lead a little meditation that I think is something we can do, and not just for ourselves. I'll explain more at the end of the podcast. Okay, so I talk about this being one big story, and it is, but we can also see, and integral helps us enormously here, that like all big stories, it's arising in different dimensions of reality at the same time. So there is this thing in the exterior, this virus that is loosed under the world, creating state changes in each of us, individually and collectively, based on our typology and even our cultural typology. Uh, I, I really enjoyed. Tom Friedman's column in yesterday's New York Times, where he was talking about the difference between tight cultures, tight societies, and loose societies, and how the tight societies like China and South Korea and Singapore are having good luck with um, lowering the curve, uh, dropping the infections, and that loose cultures are still catching up. Loose cultures like American, where it's individualistic and freedom is, you know, built into the fabric of society. And there's another important dimension that Integral has us add to Friedman's analysis, and that is modernity. The countries that are faring the best with this pandemic are the ones that are tight and modern. And in a way, this is making the whole planet more tight and modern. And we're seeing an amazing drill and collective action, as messy as it is. And I want to give a shout out to modernity because this is where modernity really shines. You know, we're not talking about squishy issues of economics and human relations and class and gender and all of that. We're talking about a virus. And it's astonishing to see the modern system kick in. The algorithms that are set off in November that says there's something fishy in Wuhan. And the researchers and scientists and statisticians and medical workers that 
kick in in response. And incidentally, just crossed off the last case of Ebola in Africa about a week and a half ago. And there's something else that I want to notice about just basic modern professionalism that from a historic perspective, it's actually heroic how these people care about their patients, humanity. You know, in earlier stages, and we're talking back in red, early traditionalism, if something went wrong, if you got sick, that was God's punishment, and I'm staying away from you. And we move into late traditionalism, early modernity, and, you know, bad things happen, but if they happen, better you than me. And David Brooks did a column on this uh, a week or so ago about how people don't really write much about the Spanish flu. Which killed millions of people in 1918. Because they weren't that proud of how they acted. And part of that has to do with life conditions. And the modern world brings us life conditions. We have resources, we have communication, we have knowledge and history that actually allows us to raise our moral development. And it's a case where in the lower right, the, 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 the systems of society actually enable us to be better people. And so you see these stories and they're standard. So there's a whole thing going on on Reddit where people take off their face masks, these medical workers, after an 18-hour shift and show their face. And uh, I, I, I suppose you saw the video of the thousand bed hospital being built in 10 days in China. There's a tight modern society for you. So I, I want also to recognize that there's, there are flashes of real integral thinking uh, that I see as well. And one of the exemplars of this, there's two I'll mention. One is Anthony Fauci who is the head of the National Institute for Infectious Disease here in America. And, you know, he is, again, you just get this vibe of integral consciousness with this guy. And I remember him from the AIDS epidemic back in the 80s. He was the spokesperson there, too. And he was the guy we listened to. And he's almost 80 now. And he doesn't look much different. And he'll contradict Trump, and he'll point out the failures, and he'll contradict the media and the uh, overreaction. He actually defends overreaction in a way that comforted me because, you know, I have antibodies to the fear industrial complex. I do. And the other one I listen to, and I guess we all have to decide who we're going to listen to, is Bill Gates. And he did what they call an Ask Me Anything, an AMA on Reddit yesterday with an epidemiologist at his side. And of course, his foundation works with epidemics of all kinds. And his analysis is just, again, comforting in the way that you realize you're not getting a political spin, or at least you're getting a minimal of political spin. So those are two of the modernists with an integral sensibility, if you ask me, that I'm paying attention to. And while we're at it, what's up with Bill Gates not running for president? I mean, he could literally have the job for the asking. And, you know, doesn't he owe us that after all we've done for him? Anyway, um, yeah, so we have this big, beautiful modern system, I feel like Trump here. And it is getting smarter and more capable. And there's all these amazing people working together on vaccines and all kinds of great stuff. And yet, alas, all of it is embedded in a larger political system or series of political systems around the world that are subject to all kinds of pre-modern and post-modern forces. And so, yes... This pandemic is fodder for the culture war, the culture war that we use to fight our way forward, as ugly as it is. And, um, you know, I don't want to really point out the worst of it uh, because I don't feel like it, for one thing. And if you want to hear the tribal critique of the left, just tune into Fox News. And if you want to hear the tribal critique of the right, 
you can tune into MSNBC and have at it. We talk about it another time. But what I want to do is, in a way, look at some bigger forces that are rising. Uh, when we look at the development of these big collective worldviews, we see that there's an oscillation between worldviews that are focused on the individual and worldviews that are focused on the collective. Even if we start with tribal, we see that that's deeply collective. And then warriors break out. In this great burst of ego and might is right. And then the pendulum moves again forward, but to that collective pole of being faithful God's people. And then we break out in modernity and be all we can be. And there's a natural oscillation that wants to happen at Green, where we integrate not just a collective worldview, but the fact that our collective uh, reality exists, that we are part of the fabric of each other. That's part of reality. And there is a sense of the collective. I mean, really, everybody's focused on the same thing, and not just in the States, but all across the planet. And that is significant in terms of the morphic field, which is another aspect of green postmodernity that we want to notice that is happening in real time. And that is, is that this is pushing us radically in the direction of world centrism in general. And that's another trajectory of development is we move from egocentric to ethnocentric family, nation, and then we get world centric in the exteriors. We can see the systems of the world, but then there's a way that we get the interiors, the culture and feelings and identities of different people around the world. And when both of those happen, the interiors and exteriors, that's, you know, we're getting into a good stable green at that point. And we want that. There's also part of this, and you can just feel it in the description, is a sensitivity. And green gets sensitive to suffering, and particularly the suffering of people who are sick, people who are poor and sick, people who are marginalized and sick. That's just the natural green thing. Hallelujah. You know, after all of human history, we finally got nice. An example I would use, it's recent, many of us lived through it, I sure did, and that's the AIDS epidemic that really arose in the mid-80s. And, you know, I'm a gay guy and I'm in my, what, late 20s, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, gays have it hard enough, we could barely come out. And now this, we bring this disease into the culture. And I thought, you know, this is going to set us back another 100 years. And it actually did the opposite. It showed, first of all, it showed gay people our own humanity uh, and the way we helped each other and the just seeing each other. And, and that was a big part of it in general was that gay people had to come out because they were either sick or they were, you know, their best friends or their lovers were sick. And it's, when that happens, you know, some of these other things become less important and, and you come out. And so the world saw us, and there was a natural outpouring of, certainly from green, there's just an automatic outpouring of support and empathy. But it, and this is the great part, you know, it expanded beyond just the liberals to include the modernist traditional still, you know, some hard going there. But gays became visible, uh, all kinds of legal rights, uh, gay marriage, and now, you know, we're everywhere. <laughs> if you look at the style or entertainment section of the New York Times, you'd think we were half the population. And that's all good. But it's a remarkable and counterintuitive response to tragedy, at least historically speaking. And I suspect we'll see much more of this as people become more sick and more visible. All right, so let's look at the traditionalists. First of all, we've been talking about traditional, modern, and postmodern as being the three worldviews that are online. And the traditionalists are the true believers on the right, and the progressives, green, postmodern, true believers on the left. 
the modernists are pulled. They're, they're less ideological. They're more practical. But they still are ideological enough, and they skew uh, half, of, roughly, of the modernists or the business-oriented people. They skew right. The other half are the academics, scientists. They tend to skew left. And, you know, so we have the contours of the culture war. And typical of the right is they are allergic to the control of the left. They're basically allergic to being controlled by each other. But on the left, it shows up as a suspicion of elites, of experts, of expertise in general. Remember, pre-modern thinking is pre-rational. That's not to say that these people aren't rational. Many of them are very rational. But their hearts are in a home and hearth, God and country place. And they appreciate the system as it is far more than the progressives who are trying to, you know, engineer it forward and damn the torpedoes. And people on the right are called to defend the system against people who do undervalue it. And you can sort of see that, that the people on the left are, their sensitivity is far more acute for the sick and the people who are helping the sick than they are for the people who are running the businesses that are, you know, thrown in turmoil here. So traditionalists hold that ground and it slows them down. You know, they're, they're not going to go with the modernist story. They're suspicious of it and they have a reason to be. It's the boy who cried wolf. You can go to Aesop and see the story. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't end well, <laughs> I don't think, for the villagers. Anyway, the, an example I would use is a tweet from Newt Gingrich, where and Newt Gingrich is a right fighter on the right. He was Speaker of the House. And the tweet says, a reporter asked me today why conservatives were initially so skeptical of the threat of the coronavirus. I tried to explain that one of the dangerous consequences of having a totally dishonest left-wing news media was that most Americans discounted their hysteria as phony. So, you know, that's how they see it. Uh, and I would also point out there's, that there's an admission in there somewhere in his tweet that says that they were slow to respond. And this is evolutionarily potent too. And we can see that again, thank God for the deep state, two cheers for the deep state, that in matters of fact, modernity wins out. And we've seen a move in real time in the last several days. Um, I'll show you a clip from Fox News. This is Judge Janine a week or so ago and a couple days ago. And, you know, her adoration, that's the only word I can think of for Trump on Fox News is unmatched. So here's Judge Janine. All the talk about coronavirus being so much more deadly doesn't reflect reality. Without a vaccine, the flu would be far more deadly. So that was then, but now. We are facing an incredibly contagious and dangerous virus that is moving across the world from one hotspot to another. So yeah, now most everyone is on board with this modern thinking, including Trump. And We've seen him flip from it's a hoax to taking it very seriously. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into Trump, please God. But I will say that even egotists can get on board. And when they do, they can be effective. And I pray he will be. We can talk more about that and him and all of this in a future episode. I'm sure this isn't going to be the last time we talk about the coronavirus. And it's a ever-changing story. I've gotten tons of links and inputs from you people and opinions. So, yeah, keep the cards and letters coming. Uh, you can email me at jeff at dailyevolver.com. All right, so I... Do want to get into a spiritual practice, it's short, but I think effective and really appropriate for these times. And if you want to stick around for that, please do. 
If not, thanks for listening and check back on the website and at the Daily Evolver, wherever you get the podcast. And we'll keep it going and we'll see you then. Okay, so I think I said that one of the things I most appreciate about integral thinking, integral consciousness, is that it re-legitimizes the spiritual dimension of reality, which is wrung out of the system by modernity and a collapse of the interior quadrants into the exteriors. Everything is seen as stuff. Integral brings back the interiors, non-material reality. And one of the things that we do as we take a multi-perspectival look at something like the coronavirus, and we see this perspective and that perspective, and we listen to this one, and we listen to that one, and we look at history, and we bring it all in, you know. And we actually, at some point, there's a shift in consciousness where we're identified not with any particular perspective, but the space within which perspectives are arising. And you realize that they're arising under their own power. You can watch your mind. It's one of the great first insights of meditation. We see that this thing has a mind of its own. And um, and the more perspectives you can hold, there's a natural wisdom that arises that puts everything in a more intelligent pattern, I guess is the best way of putting it. And this is wisdom in general in terms of the sort of positive polarity between wisdom and compassion in the spiritual realm. We're working on both of these things. Wisdom being an appreciation of the oneness, of the one pattern. And compassion being a heartbreaking relatedness with every suffering and particular thing. And anything that is particular and is separated from the all is suffering. There's, that is the the nature, the suffering is built into that. So we're doing both these things. And on the oneness side of the street, we realize that every thought we have is part of a morphic field that is connected with other human beings. Every thought, every behavior, every emotion, that we're part of this soup. And that as we work with our own mind and heart, that has effects beyond us, that are timeless and eternal, not in the sense of being really, really long or big or whatever, but in terms of being part of a dimension of reality that is beyond words and thought, but that can be apprehended and felt and experienced. And so what we're gonna do is a a meditation of exchanging self with other. It's a Buddhist meditation is how I learned it. It's called Tonglen meditation. Many of you know it. It's part of the second turning of Buddhism where Buddhists realized that just personal enlightenment isn't enough, that you have to become a bodhisattva. You you don't have to become a bodhisattva, but you're called to become a bodhisattva, which means that you're dedicating your life to other people, that you literally postpone your own enlightenment until all beings are enlightened. So anyway, so what we do with this meditation is knowing that we're part of this bigger fabric, that we meditate on the suffering and meditate to relieve in real time the suffering of other beings. And so what we're going to do is it's a simple breath meditation where you breathe in some flavor of suffering and you can start with your own, just like your own fear, your own confusion around this coronavirus. You can feel it right now. And know that there are millions of people who are feeling this and worse. And to contemplate that and contemplate people who are sick and they're in an overloaded healthcare system and, and the people who are working in the overloaded healthcare system and the people who are seeing their businesses dissolving or their livelihoods and they're confused about that and people who are angry and panicked 
And whatever it might be, whatever is that flavor, but some flavor that you yourself share. And then breathe that in, which is a, just a natural dropping of resistance. And I always think of good old Shinzen Young, my original meditation teacher, who taught that pain multiplied times resistance equals suffering. And that pain multiplied by mindfulness and equanimity. So a precision feeling, mindfulness of the components of your suffering. And then equanimity, just the allowing it to flow, trusting, giving it to God, if you will. That those two things uh, bring relief of suffering. So we breathe in the suffering. And we breathe out some version of relief. Feel the relief itself in the breath. Or a smile. Or I always love what Trump has said, breathe out wholeheartedness. And I love that. So we can maybe then get a clearer picture of another person who is in the same situation with us. And we can again breathe in. And breathe out relief. Each breath, we can bring uh, enhanced clarity and um, just get sort of better at it. And if we're right about there being a morphic field and a spiritual dimension that we're all plugged into, then this meditation is doing real good in the world. It's something we can do. And at any rate, it gives us a chance to contemplate other people, which is really important here as we're all isolated, and see how else we could help, you know, financially or in whatever way that we can. So I think I'll call it a day with that. Again, more to come. Uh, let me know what you think, jeff at dailyevolver.com, and see you next time, God willing.